So I'd just like to welcome everyone. My name is Ephraim Katsir, and on behalf of Sephardic Heritage International in D.C., or Shin D.C., welcome you to our Makam of the Week webinar with Syrian Jewish Udist, vocalist, and teacher, Asher Shasho Levi. And so thank you for joining us. And here is Asher Shasho Le Levi with Makam of the Week, Class 1. It's a pleasure to be able to do this. Thank you, Ephraim. Thank you to everyone for joining. I feel blessed that you all um, are interested in this and are joining today. So um, I thought what better way to start off with a little bit of music before we uh, delve into some of the technicalities of, uh, of the Muhammad. I want to sing a little bit of Hine uh, Makol Manai in the Syrian Yerushalmi melody. Um, actually, it's a, it's a contrafact of, of an Arabic song, Washin Akhla. In Maham Bayat, it's not this week's Maham, but the sentiment is true. It's a good one to know, but the words, the good it is for us to, to be together, even though we're not physically sitting together, we're not in one space, we're creating the space where we're going to be able to learn together. And um, I really, I really would like for this class, if anyone has any specific elements of this music and this tradition and this way of applying tefillah that they've wanted to learn but hasn't been accessible, reach out to me and I will try and include it in the future classes. But today, I really want to get everyone on the same level in terms of what we're talking about here with the Makama. So, that last song I played, that last piece of Matob, we'll use that as an example. That is in Makam Bayat, or Makam Bayati, and it's one of the most fundamental of the Makama. Um, I believe the most pismonim in the Syrian tradition are um, in that maqam. Of all of the maqam, I think it's the most popular. By the way, some people say maqam, some people say ma'am. 
because in Syrian Arabic and certain dialects of Levantine Arabic, um, you have that huh sound drops into just a glottal. So you'll hear it differently in different, in different communities. But um, in general, uh, Bayak is one of the most popular uh, of the Muhammad. And I thought it would be good to use that as sort of an introduction because in order to really learn today's maqam, look, today's maqam for this week is maqam saba, which is actually one of the most difficult of the maqam. Um, definitely, it's, it's taking the plunge. It's jumping straight into something that is one of the more advanced. So in order to understand how maqam saba works, you actually sort of have to understand how maqam bayat works. So a maqam... People talk about it as being a scale, right? That's what most people think of it as. It's the scalar system of Middle Eastern music, or specifically Levantine music and Turkish music uses this system of scales. But what I want to focus on in this class is, yeah, learning how these scales work, but also the full system. Because in the context of Syrian Jewish and Turkish Jewish and Egyptian Jewish and all of these other traditions, of tefillah, you have to understand how these maqamat work, how they function, not just thinking of it as a scale, in order to really um, dive into the depths of this tradition. So, in a Halabi Syrian community, that's my, my tradition, um, every week of the year is associated with a different maqam. And that maqam is tied in with the perasha of the week. So there is some sort of theme in perasha, in, in the perasha that ties in with whatever maqam the tefillah will be done that week. And then there are also pismonim every week. Um, everyone know what a pismon is? I'll, I'll clarify what pismonim are, specifically in the Syrian context. Um, they're these typically, it's a, it's a repertoire of songs. They're not bachashot. They're not of that particular mystical repertoire of, I believe, 61 songs, but they're mostly contrafacta. They're mostly songs that take their melodies from Arabic and Turkish music, folk songs, Ottoman classical music, um, a lot of 20th century sort of popular music from Egypt uh, becomes the basis of this system of tefillah. But in these traditions, the maqam gets an emotional meaning. And e every tradition has sort of a different understanding of what the emotional weight of each of each maqam is. I understand that in a sort of more general Arabic milieu, today's maqam of the week, maqam saba, is understood to be something that is sort of sad and longing, but uh, and it looks sort of a yearning maqam. But in the Syrian tradition, uh, Syrian Jewish tradition that is, maqam saba is associated with um, the word saba, is the same as, like in modern Israeli Hebrew, tzava, arm, tzava. Uh, so it's associated with strength, with sort of um, whenever there are shows of, of sort of a military strength or a verse that says, lisbol tzava, that's one association. Or the brit milah. The brit milah is associated with this, with this ma'am specifically, um, ma'am saba, and... Um, that's something that is, um, there are a number of reasons, basically. There, is a, there are a number of connections. We don't have to get into specifically why Saba is for Mila. There are a number of sources in, in Tanakh that connect to that. But basically, it's enough to know, I think, as a basis, and, and as I mentioned, if anyone has any questions, please ask. But as a basis that the Mahamat can be used emotionally in a different context within, uh, you know, Syrian tefillah or general Sephardic tefillah. Um, so, starting with the ma'am that we just ma'am bayat, every ma'am is based on um, certain elements. And I think these elements are important to know. Um, so you have um, these scales that, the, that make up each ma'am. When people say that ma'am is a scale that are tied together by different sort of root notes or a nucleus of each portion. And if you played all of the right notes, but you played them ascending and descending wrong, or you went up too fast, or you didn't stay in the right place, it wouldn't feel right. So if I played Ma'am Bayati, and I played it like this, um, that's all the right notes, but it doesn't sound like, it doesn't sound like Bayat, because in order to create 
you know, this mood of bayat, you have to establish the makam by first playing um, j- the jeans or ajnas. Jeans is singular, ajna plural. These are, I would call them, I would call them scale fragments, basically. Um, so for bayat, the first of these ajnas, jeans bayat, would be. It's this tetrachord, and that's what makes up bayat. So, uh, D, E quarter flat, F, G, that's the basis of makam bayat. And that also becomes a building block for other makam. So, if you wanted to do a Husseini makam, that's the bottom, is, is bayat, and the top is ras, which is another makam. But the reason I'm specifically going on so much about Bayat is because today's Maham, Maham Saba, has the first three notes of the Bayat tetrachord. So D, E quarter flat, and F. But it's not considered as being based on Bayat. Why? Because it's emphasized in a different way. I'll, I'll explain. So if you, had, if you had Maham Bayat, the way that it's built is this way. That's the first bit. So the tension and, and all the movement in this maham comes from the these first four notes and the way that they play off each other and the way that you ascend and descend before going up to the second jeans of the maham. But in Saba, it's all about the third. The third is the most important note, and it's really sort of hard to think of a comparison in Western music. Maybe there are some others here who are more conversant in Western music terminology than myself, but there, it, it's almost like there are, I would say, movable roots in Maham Saba, that the root changes as you move through the Maham, and there are not a lot of other Mahamat that work exactly this way. So the first three notes are exactly the same as you would have in Maham Bayad. D, E quarter flat, and F. But the way that you are accenting them is to get to that Jin Saba, which is to go up the half step from the F. That's what makes it Saba. And so it sounds completely different when all of the tension is around that half step there on the F. So the difference between Jin Spaya, Jin Saba, is tremendous. Just with one note change, it doesn't even, it's not even considered in the same family of Mahama. And that goes to show that, that the Maham has a lot to, it's less to do necessarily with um, the actual notes and the scale and more with how they're constructed with typical phrases. And, and uh, that's something really that I think is worth, is worth looking into as we, as we move through these classes and move through this period. So let's look at the breakdown of of Saba. Fryam, I think we have the Saba chart, the, the actual notation for it. Perhaps we can share that. Otherwise, people can look at it in the materials that were sent out, I believe. It's on page three. Okay, this is the breakdown of Saba. So, Saba, first, it starts with Saba. When we think of Saba, the actual the genes of Saba, the, the sort of scale fragment, the... Um, these, these tetrachords and pentachords, um, the first one in Maham Saba is appropriately called Saba, because if any Maham has this, it's going to have the flavor of Saba, because it's so unique. So we're looking at the first. There are also two variations of Saba, and we'll look at both. Um, and Saba also, when I, when I mentioned how it has sort of a floating root, it also is not necessarily strictly an eight-note scale. So that's also worth noting. Uh, this is actually, it's an, it, this is an interesting one to start with because it does not really parallel Western scales. Uh, and so I think this may be helpful for um, dispelling the notion that Maham and scale are one-to-one. Uh, so, Saba on D. We're going to start with that. D, uh, E half flat, F. I would say for those musicians here, the E half flat in Saba tends to be uh, slightly sharper than the E half flat in Bayak, just from, uh, from experience. Uh, 
that's how it tends to be sort of ornamented. So uh, the difference might be something like this, where in Baigat you would have Saba. So it's very, it's very minor. It's a very minor difference. Maybe, maybe the equivalent to uh, less than a comma or about a comma, that, that eighth of a, of a, of a, a scale degree that, that, that is used in Turkish maqam. Uh, but starting Saba, we often, we often start on the C below the D. And the F is where we land. That is the sort of uh, nucleus. That's the, that's the center of the beginning of this maqam. So if you're going to improvise on it, you would go basically what I would do typically. Go to the F and sort of hang on the F a little bit and establish the F as more important than it would be in Bayat. So in Bayat, I would sort of, I would move around the F and I wouldn't pay as much attention to it. But here, since it gives the scale its gravity, I would, sp I would spend a lot of time on the F. And this is the same in singing. So in singing, you would do oh, and oh, something like that, where you sort of, the F becomes where the action is going. And that is actually a preview of the next, of the next genes of, of this maham, which is the hijaz on F. So we go from... So you get a little hijaz in there in on the way up. Um, we'll do a whole other class another time on the tuning of Maham Hijaz because it's not exactly um, what you would think. All of those notes after the F are would be slightly microtonal. So um, from the beginning of the scale. That's sort of what you're what you're dealing with, but each of those is a separate piece, so you wouldn't you wouldn't really play it like that. You would play it more like this if you were to establish it. Establish that element just briefly of this maha. And then moving up, you have ajam on B flat. So what's ajam? Ajam is like a major, is a major scale. And it's uh, you get just a few notes of that. And that's one way that you can go up, but you don't have to do that. There's also an option to have a hijaz on C. So let me demonstrate the two variants. <laughs> And then so you can continue with a B-flat ajam. Like that. Or you have a second hijaz, a hijaz transposition. So from the saba on D, this would be the second, the second staff. Um, Jazz there on C. And then you're back down to your, your B flat. And that's sort of just in a nutshell how you would um, build Saba. Let me, I think it's probably best for me to just demonstrate um, how this would work in the course of an improvisation, in the course of a, of a taqasim. And um, I'll just do a brief one. I'll build it. I'll start from the base, the saba on D, which is the, the core of this maham, build up, and then end up back um, where I started, basically. And I'm going to try and do it with not so much ornamentation so that people can hear how this works in a very sort of basic sense. Thank you. 
I'm wondering um, if you're transitioning from Saba to uh, Hijaz, would you do Hijaz in C or Ajam in B flat, or could you do both? You could do both. Okay. Yeah, you definitely could do both. Um, personally, I uh, I tend to do more of the Hijaz on C. I tend to prefer that. Um, it's more natural, and it's the way I learned this. Um, but really, it's all it's all the same. It's not necessarily like a scale like Hijaz, where you have one way up and one way down. It's not really it's not really the same. Though there may be people who do it like that. I'm I'm only speaking from what I learned, and everyone should be aware what I learned was all really in the context of tefillah and the elements of Arabic classical music. I learned later and also mostly within a pismonium and tefillah context. So if anyone is aware of any other spaces within the Arabic world or musical traditions that do things differently in terms of these ma'amat, um, I'm actually, I would be happy to hear it. I understand that the way Turkish musicians play this ma'am is, is actually quite different in terms of the intonation. Um, but, but yeah, really, the, to answer your question, you can really sort of, mix and match them. Any other questions before we move on to the Gizmon? I have a question. Yes, Isaac. Um, so in the context of tefillah, uh -huh. um, are there specific sort of uh, melodic patterns and things which are used? Because um, I'm coming at this as an outsider of the Syrian tradition, but I'm familiar with that in, in Ashkenazi cantorial tradition, generally you don't just have a mode you also have like specific melodies that are required with it. Like if you're doing a mode that's Adonai Malach, then you have a da 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 or something like that. It's not just a, it's not just the scale and the key notes. So are there any like specific melodic flourishes or things used in tefillah when using maqam sabah? So I would say that, and I, and I apologize for butchering my Arabic. No, it's it's really good actually. I wish everyone tried as hard as you did and got it as close as you did. Um, Truly, um, the point really is that it's not a one-to-one -one comparison. It's there are elements of Ashkenazi Hazanut that are similar to Syrian Hazanut in terms of application, but really fundamentally the systems work very, very differently. And um, if you hear two Hazanim doing a Tefila in Maham Saba, actually that would be something that would be worth for me sharing. I know I have a lot of recordings of different Hazanim doing a Tefila in the same Maham. They're different. They're just totally different. It's improvised, I would say. And there are points in the Tefila that are set. Um, so if you look at every week of Pismo, and, and they're doing an even better job, actually, um, of doing this, but the pismonim.org, um, the folks there have been putting out really nice PDFs of every week um, going over the meaning of the Ma'am of the week, but then also doing what they call a Hazanit survey. And so, Isaac, that should actually answer your question. There are melodies that are considered to be iconic for each Ma'am. So, maybe in a more general Sephardic community, like a Jerusalem Sephardic community, um, they would be used whenever you're doing the maqam. So if you're doing, you know, maqam bayat, you do the most famous ones. Whereas in Assyrian, particularly Brooklyn, Latin America, in those contexts, there are actually melodies that are typically associated with each week. So there are many weeks of the year that have maqam bayat, for instance, as the maqam, or maqam ras. But depending on which Shabbat it is and what the content of the perashah is, there will be different melodies. Um, 
I think it's worth going over what the areas of tefila that we're talking about that are going to be sung in a um, in a Sephardic context. We're talking about um, there's going to be a melody for Adonai Malach. There's going to be uh, a melody for Nishmat. There's going to be a melody, congregational singing melody for the end of Nishmat, Shabbat Anim. We're going to learn today, actually, a pizmon that is applied this week for Shabbat Anim. Uh, then there's for Befi, um, El HaHodaot as a melody. There will be typically a big Kaddish at that point. So before the Baruch Hu, the Kaddish will be quite ornamented and it will sort of set the Maham in a certain way. Then... In Syrian communities, typically El Adona and Kole Ma'asim is not sung all the way through. It's only sung from Semahim da Setam. Whereas in other Sephardic communities, it is, uh, it is sung all the way through. So you'll have variance between Aleppo and Damascus, Jerusalem, Sephardic, Egypt, things like that. Um, then the Misraim de Al Tanu is a part that is sung. And then in the Kedusha, the Nakhdisha is sung. Um, and then there will be there'll be tizmonim for each week that are associated. Um, does that make sense, Isaac, in terms of how it's, it's structured? Yeah, thanks. Um, so, I also want to know that next class I should bring my Syrian suitor with me so that I'll be able to follow along with all of that. Good call. I can also share pages from from that I have in PDF. Um, yeah, but basically the Hazan has to um, really establish the mahab between the areas of singing. In a strictly Syrian milieu, a hazan would be, a, I would say, would be docked points for varying the makkah. Um, it should be stuck to, and it should be established, and that should be the feel of Shabbat. I would say that's the biggest difference, by the way. People sometimes ask me, that's the biggest difference between Yerushalmi and Halabi, is that in the Yerushalmi tradition, there is a lack of fealty to sticking to the maqam and being strict in that way. Whereas in the Syrian Halabi tradition, um, the maqam is, is, is basically stuck. So, um, let's actually jump in, since, um, unless anyone has any other questions, let's jump in. Yeah, to... One other quick question? Yes, of course, of course. That's what this is um, for. My instrument is a wind instrument, a clarinet. Uh -huh. I do quarter tones. And that doesn't mean that there isn't a way to do it. Is there any way to do quarter tones on a wind instrument? Like that? Absolutely. Um, in fact, I would I would look up, um, just off the top of my head, you should listen to uh, Taksim Trio from Turkey. Um, okay. They have an absolutely wonderful clarinetist who plays microtonally. Um, and there are, you know, there are, even, there, there are even some really good saxophone players from Egypt. I, the names escape me right now, but I know that there are a few. Who, Any who book that would tell me how to begin to do that? I would look into Turkish style clarinet in particular, okay. because that would be uh, you could if you learn the techniques of, of a Turkish style clarinet playing, um, all of the makamat or as they say makamlar would be ex just accessible at that point. You're lucky. I play a piano. I have absolutely no way to do quarter tones. Wrong. Mm. Have you ever been to a, uh, a Sephardic like? Hakla or party or something like that, and see the guy with the like workstation synth that is assigned quarter tones. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah, I don't know how to do that. Uh, if, if, neither if, do I, but it's it's it is possible to play. If I music. could do that, then that would be great. But I I need to figure out how. Well, that actually brings up an in before we before we go to the pizma that brings up an interesting point. One of the reasons saba is a hard makam, and also a makam that I would say people are not very fluent. This is, if someone, if you go to your average, you know, Yerushalmi, like Israeli Sephardic synagogue or whatever, and someone gets up to lead Tefillah, they're going to do it in Kurd, or they're going to do it in Nahawan, or they're going to do it in Ajam. For reference, Kurd. Nahawan. Ajam. scales that are not really microtone based. So scales like Saba um, get lost, I think, a, a fair bit with, you know, just the, the standardization of pitches even. Um, yeah, so I think that's why it's important to, to keep playing 
these and to also talk about how the microtones are pitched because um, even when you assign them on a keyboard, they're generally standardized to be quarter tones and that's generally not accurate for everything. Okay, so let's all take a look at today's Kizmon, um, which is Ya O De Lach Ya. So this uh, Pizmon, I think, is a perfect Pizmon for us to, to look at this week as the last thing we do. Um, first of all, it is truly in Saba. This Pizmon really establishes a feeling of Saba. If you can't feel the Saba in this, you're not going to hear it in anything. Because this one is just the base genes of Saba, really. Just the... All you really need is that... That's all you need for this. It's basically just that. And this is a song um, that has its... This is another contrafactor. This takes its melody from uh, an Arabic song, as it says, And I can send out a recording of Sabah Fakhri doing that. Uh, and then there's also a, a really wonderful Turkish version. So this is a song like many of these pismonim that finds its, um, its roots, its melody, from shared repertoire between the sort of Shami Arabic tradition, the Syrian Lebanese Arabic tradition of the Levant, and then also Turkish Ottoman music. So I have a question about that. that. Yes, of course, please. Is, is, there a, is there a link between the fact that the name of the original song sounds so much like Ya Ode Lahya? Totally. All that of is, the songs are written to... But, um, like, is that a pun? That, like, Yahweh the Lap is, is, like, is that... And, and then the, and the Pismon adaptation sounds sort of like that? Is that... That's how all Pismon adaptations are written. I encourage you to look through um, any book of Syrian Pismonim and just consider the percentage of the Pismonim where the words are written to mimic the sonics of the Arabic. Um, and I'm trying to think off the top of my head what other ones we have. Um, oh, yeah, so um, there's Chochma um, Bina Ya'eli is Ahba um, Bina Ya'eni. Um, then there's Eli Ya'eli, Chon Eli, I believe, is Khali Ya'khali. Um, a lot of these songs just, um, like, I think Nora El Nora is, is like Nura Ya Nura or something like that. They're all, all of these take, there's something about the sonics of the poetry that is really integral in the Arabic poetry. Um, of these songs that the writers of these Pismoni were really conscious of. And it's a tradition that goes back to, um, you know, the golden age of Spain when there was a flowering of medieval Sephardic poetry and the work of the Geonim. And it's just this... I this was going to say, it reminded me of a, of a medieval Spanish thing where they took this medieval Arabic song, which was called like Kal mm -hmm. and then wrote a song to it, which was Kol Libi. Right, exactly. So that tradition is still very much alive and thriving in the Syrian world, um, where songs are written to, to sound, you know, the contrafact that sounds like this. So let's just get into this a little bit. We're going to do it, um, we're going to do it Saba on D, to keep it simple. Um, so the way it goes is this, I'll, st I'll start, I'll play it slowly, I'll sing it slowly, and then we can all try and, try and get a little bit of this to take to our respective Shabbatot. <laughs> So nice. So, 
Um, so it's that F up the half step, slid down to the E F flat. And then by the time you end up on the next line, you want to be down at the root of the D. To go back up. Back to the D. Again. Any questions? Let's go through it. Let's sing it. So we'll do, um, the way I'll do it is I'll do Ya Ode, and then I'll do verses and go back to Ya Ode as the chorus. That's how we think of it. I'll give a little ta little tapasim to, to establish so. to a tefillah. So this is a melody. This is a great melody to know. It's a fundamental song for Saba. There's Arabic words, there's Turkish words, there's the, this pismon is written to it, but this song is also something that would be used um, in the context of the tefillah. So it would be used most often, I would say, for um, Shabbat Anim. Shabbat Anim like that basically and it sort of would um, go into something else actually for Bifi Yisharim 
honestly. In a Syrian context, you, I mean, here's the thing. You want to keep on singing it. You want to keep on singing it. From my experience, they would only use it for those two lines. And then for Bifi Sharim, use something else. And that's what's shown in the Hazanut survey for this week. But if you're in a, a context that is not all, you know, old Syrian people, you can use this for a lot of different things. It's, it works for many, many different applications. Um, as long as you stress the words carefully, um, it can work for many different things. Um, are there any points of clarification that anyone would like? Either on the pismon or any just general terminology or anything we went over? No? Okay, let's... Uh... Someone says it works on Hashem Melech. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Good application. Very, very good application. Um, let's do the last verse. Um, Le'al Mahu. And uh, two times through Ya'odeh. And then we'll be uh, Shabbat Shalom for everyone. And I hope everyone who's enjoyed this... Uh, Please reach out to me. I'm happy to share any resources. I'm happy to help anyone work through these uh, pismonim. And I hope everyone joins next week. I think this is going to be a wonderful way for us to work through this cycle, especially at a time when, you know, most of us, I think, are not, you know, in Kenis on, on Shabbat. We're not singing. We're not with community in that way. So we can create singing communities like this in creative ways. <laughs> this week. I needed to be in, with people and, and share this music of the heart, this, this tefillah, this tradition, this, this heritage. So um, I'm really grateful to all of you. Thank you so much, Ephraim, for all you did, for putting everything together and making this happen. And I hope everyone joins us next week. Shabbat shalom, borach, everyone. Shabbat shalom, tadarabah. This is a great thing to do. Thank you for doing it. It's my pleasure. Both of you. It's my pleasure. Again, thank you for, for joining us. I, I really needed that too. So thank you so much. Um, and Shabbat Shalom. Or, uh, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Meborah. Meborah. Exactly. <laughs> All right. So the Makam of the Week webinar with Asher Asher Levy. He said it, it's a weekly class that occurs every Friday and ends on August 28th. So please join us via the same Zoom information each week. The next class is on Friday, June 12th, 5 p.m. Eastern Time, 2 p.m. Pacific Time in the U.S. and Canada. And you can also email any questions to Asher between classes. At Asher Shashel Levy at shindc.org, which is either the same as his Instagram. So please also be sure to follow him. So please make sure that you're receiving the emails from us. Check you should you should already have one from info at shindc.org. So keep checking that for updates and class materials. 
And is there a place to donate? One who wants to donate, email info at shindc.org. Shabbat shalom, everyone. Um, Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom, Borach. Shabbat shalom. This was really Shabbat wonderful. Shalom. Shabbat shalom, Thank you everyone. so much. Thank you all for Shabbat shalom.